The world is weird, it makes me mad, but at least I get to talk about it with Jose. In the first episode of the 1999 animated series Futurama, a delivery boy named Fry gets transported 1,000 years into the future. When he's outfitted for a chip that will forever brand him as a delivery boy, it's done so under the auspices of the motto, you gotta do what you gotta do. This image perfectly captures the idea of being swallowed up by a system that will make every decision for you, and you can only resign yourself to the idea that this is how the world works. Terms like these carry this deep resignation that the world is the way it is, and change just isn't going to happen. Some of the most popular political content on YouTube can fall under the category of owning the libs, anti-SJW commentary, taking down the right, or some other adversarial position. It tries to create the idea of a political position not so much around what a person believes, but what that person perceives themselves as standing up against. Over the past few weeks, some of the major controversies in the social media space have been manufactured nonsense, from the potato head rebranding to some old Dr. Seuss book no longer being published. But you can see similar narratives cropping around real stories, such as the recent shooting in Atlanta. Discussions about issues regarding the LGBT community, race, and gender are immediately waved aside. The problem isn't just that figures on the right lie about this stuff. The bigger issue is that they're telling their audience that it's not something worth caring about to begin with and those who do claim to care about it are either hypocrites or cultists. The Innuendo Studios YouTube channel has a couple of videos on this topic from its alt-right playbook series, particularly how rhetoric is used to control conversations using a barrage of accusations. It's why so many of the stories I mentioned above are always framed as attacks. It's never an issue explored, it's always phrased as the left are hysterical and out of control when no one would even know about these issues if it wasn't for some right-wing loudmouth bringing them up first. What I want to focus on is not just how the right engages with this debate, but how there's this implicit effort to get people to disengage entirely from the world of politics. One of the most effective ways of controlling public conversation is convincing people not to engage in it, at least not honestly. Back when I made my big video on Dave Rubin many years ago, one of the weirdest things about his content was how often he said he didn't want to be talking about politics. It's a line I saw repeated by the likes of Tim Pool, The Quartering, or anyone who serves a young right-wing audience. This idea that they really wish they didn't have to talk about any of this stuff, but if it wasn't just for those darn people on the left, we could ignore it and go back to talking about fun things. Carried with that is this idea that caring about this stuff is not really worthy of attention, if not for the rabble-rousers, who are supposedly not coming from an honest place. And the reason they tell their audience to care about now is because it's a threat to the status quo. Baked into this mindset is the idea that the world is essentially fine the way it is. Injustices are rare, local, and handled by the systems we have in place. Maybe we need some tweaks, sometimes there's a bad apple, but things are actually pretty good right now and we don't have to worry about any sort of systemic changes. If someone feels satisfied in their life, they're a lot less likely to become politically active. And if they're told the world is fine, aside from the rabble-rousers, that's another incentive to just tune out and not really engage with politics. And I know that sounds counterproductive if you're trying to win an election, but it also pairs with the fact that some people know there are problems in their lives and the world isn't perfectly fine when there are people who are struggling. Most of those problems will be filed under the idea that this is just the way the world works. Best to just accept it, be a grown-up, and move on. But if the person is still annoyed because, well, there's a lot about the world that sucks, a villain needs to be created. So if anything bad happens, it's probably the left's fault. Their audience is motivated into action only against the perceived threat to their status quo. Things were always fine before they changed. That's the essence of right-wing messaging, because, of course, it's maintaining the status quo or possibly some reactionary stuff to move things backwards. It's never the system that's the problem. It's the bad actor or actors who have ruined it. It's how an unjust police killing is framed as one bad apple rather than symbolic of a systemic problem. Or if a scientific body is saying we need to change how we think about something, it's probably been infiltrated by some provocateurs. The system is fine, it's just some rotten agents who have somehow corrupted it from within. And if we just get rid of a couple of bad people, we can go back to not talking about these things and not really caring, because things are fine in the status quo. That's why the aforementioned controversies are framed as an attack by the left. They're signaling to their audience that caring about this stuff is silly, and only silly people on the left do it. But if we let this slide, we could very well end up in some kind of 1984-esque hellscape. Notice that in all of that rhetoric, 
No political actions are really espoused aside from some vague references to principles like free speech. There are no policy ideas or broader initiatives, just a vague hatred for the other side. Because why would you need to motivate someone into political action when your politics are based on keeping things the same? Here's what apathetic political engagement would look like. One morning, there will be a story all over social media about how the left, those scoundrels, have decided that Paddington Bear is now a female bear. The right-wing pundosphere, all in unison, will start talking about how the left is out of control and if this is to stand, soon the nation and the West will all fall. And the audience laps it up. They might even up their donations. The mainstream press reports on it with some confusion as to why anyone would care about this, but still, you know, reporting on it because they're hungry for the ratings. And this eventually filters up to opportunistic politicians who will give speeches designed specifically for Twitter where they decry that poor Paddington Bear will now be a she instead of a he. The big winners in all of this are the right-wing media people who get clicks, the mainstream media who get ratings, and politicians who might get a few votes. A few votes, by the way, based on sharing a common interest, not because they're proposing some kind of Paddington-centric legislation. Or even if they draw up that bill because the story lasts a little longer in the news cycle than most, it'll probably be shot down and quickly forgotten because, really, this is all performance theater. What exactly are the politics of all of this? As best I can tell from this scenario I just made up, it would be that the left is terrible and trying to change things when things should never be changed, with subtle digs at women and the LGBT community for good measure. This isn't really a coherent political ideology. It's just a brief exercise of rage designed to whip everyone into a frenzy before they settle back down and go back to the world, ready to let it resume unchanged. It's basically the two-minute hate from 1984. And I now demand bonus points for making a 1984 reference that isn't completely played out and actually makes sense. Politics should be about something, you know, a goal, some kind of achievable end. This anger that's stoked is designed to get people riled up without them actually channeling that anger to something constructive. Aside from, you know, providing monetary support to the right-wing media system and voting for politicians who will do absolutely nothing for them. In one of the rare instances where one of these stories can break through, it's in service to a power structure trying to maintain the status quo, such as a government pressure in a university to remove certain courses from its curriculum or removing training that raises issues of systemic inequalities. Political victory here looks like silencing the other side of the debate in an effort to maintain the status quo. This is also why conservative commentators often frame their critiques of these issues so dishonestly. They present these issues to their audience as nonsensical, as a way of signaling to them that these issues can be safely ignored and discarded. Framing these ideas honestly would force this side to genuinely engage with them, but by not doing that, they can effectively make their audience misinformed, disengaged, and apathetic towards any sort of social change. Another way this takes shape that's very similar to apathy is cynicism. While it exists across the political spectrum, I think it's much stronger on the right. The ethos of, that's just the way the world is, without ever exploring the thought on the way the world can be. And while there is reason to use cynicism, the world is a rough place, and progress doesn't always work out, there's a difference between acknowledging that reality and becoming a cynic yourself. When you can transform people into cynics, that's really advantageous to anyone trying to maintain the status quo. So it shouldn't be a surprise that it's the tool most often deployed by people who have the most to lose if the system were changed. It's not a coincidence that so much billionaire money funds these fringe right-wing outlets. From PragerU to the Daily Wire, these media companies can trace their origins to investments from fracking and oil industries that are looking for a slick outlet that will fight to ensure regulations aren't imposed upon industries that make climate change worse and undermine investment in renewable energy. This can mean everything from spreading lies about climate change to relentlessly attacking politicians seeking to implement policies that would reduce carbon emissions. In other words, they fight to maintain the status quo. As a side note, I would like to say that this doesn't mean that Dennis Prager or Ben Shapiro are necessarily frauds doing it for the money. I suppose it could be true. The main point is, the reason these guys are funded is because they say the things the energy billionaires want them to say. Whether or not it's genuine or not misses the whole point of why they exist in the first place. The point of channels like these are to confuse political activism as engaging with the channels themselves. That is to say, you are achieving some kind of political goal by consuming the content they produce. In effect, you are helping to dunk on the libs by watching one of these videos. You aren't advocating for policy change, of course. You aren't encouraging political activism. 
You're just pointing at laughing at someone, and the world continues on without any major changes, which is the whole point. That's the sinister nature of these channels, all the while collecting subscriber fees and advertising dollars along the way, and directing you to vote for the occasional politician who will help their donors make a few extra billion dollars. And who wouldn't feel cynical seeing a business model like that laid out? The truth is a depressing thing sometimes, but I hope that no one watching this would ever consider giving in to a power imbalance like that on the basis of the idea that this is how the world works. Apathy and cynicism are poison to the left. It discourages activism and encourages disengagement. It's never expressly endorsed, but as I hope I've demonstrated, is implicit in a lot of conservative media. While you might be able to debate someone on facts or reach them through emotion, it's a lot harder when the very idea of caring about something is made distasteful, or the only things people seem to care about are standing in opposition to some perceived enemy. And particularly, I hate how the left's compassion and kindness are presented as disingenuous or manipulative, as if no one could truly believe these things. It's certainly possible to believe these things if you're willing to actually have some empathy and concern for the people around you, and sometimes even the people you've never met. One of the nice things about caring is if you believe in it and you do it, it's true. Certainly, I've been just as guilty of this as anyone, and I'm not convinced it's necessarily a bad thing entirely. Pointing out how full of crap people are is important, but pointing out how wrong someone is isn't the same thing as having a political ideology. It's also something that hurts us more than it hurts the right. We need to organize and create action to change the world for the better, and they don't. What do we do, Jose? Tell us the answers. If you would like to know a starting point, I would suggest you look as local as possible. This is where you'll have the strongest impact as an individual. Think about the issues that matter most to you and join local organizations that engage with them, whether it's something like environmentalism or labor reforms or social justice issues more broadly. Look up public forums like city council meetings or residents association meetings, anywhere where people are offered an open forum to discuss the issues that matter to them and meet other people who care about the same things. Even something as simple as attending a protest can make a difference. Try to think of it as joining a group, a community that can help change the world around you. Because when you find more of those people who are like you and want to change things, you'll realize you actually have a lot of power when you work together. However you decide to use your political consciousness, I just want you to try to be constructively engaged. And as terrible as the world is sometimes, we can't afford the luxury of not caring enough to want to make the world a better place. Humanity has been slowly improving itself over generations, but it never got better by not caring. This is a, a short video. I know people like the shorter ones, but I try not to make them unless I have something I actually want to say. And this is something that's been on the back of my mind for a while. You can join the lovely people whose names are floating up the screen. Those are my patrons and members. They don't just get their names in the credits, although that's pretty awesome, right? They also get early access to videos and download things to my theme songs. It's all super cool. If you'd like to support the channel in a non-monetary fashion, you can like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. If you don't know what to comment, why not tell me your favorite song that's a cover of another song? Thank you everyone for watching.